since you begin to move the pointer, I'll stop and you take over. Do you understand? Awakenings. Well, what are you waiting for? You want a piggyback ride? Actually, I was wondering about Mr. Anderson. After dark, my sweet. I didn't marry you for this. I could have had anybody. Reversal of fortune. What do these three films have in common? Well, each one is on either my list or Gene's list of the 10 best films of 1990. And some of them might even be on both lists because the lad is capable of learning. On this special edition of Siskel and Ebert, we'll each be showcasing films on our lists, including our picks for the best film of the year. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And we'll start near the bottom of my list and work our way up during the show. My number nine selection is the thoroughly original comedy, The Freshman, Andrew Bergman's delightful tale of a film student at New York University who was befriended by a mobster who looks exactly like the most famous mobster in movie history, Don Vito Corleone. Here's the fabulous scene where the kid, Matthew Broderick, first meets the Don, played by Marlon Brando, who will be asking him to do him a favor. This is my uncle, Carmine Sabatini. Uncle Carmine, this is Clark. Hey, you know, you never told me your last name. Kellogg. Kellogg. Just like the cereal. Yeah. That's like right. the breakfast cereal. <laughs> I haven't seen anything you know, quite wrong. like the freshman before, and that's always a great compliment to pay to a movie. Writer-director Andrew Bergman throws out all formulas, making fun of film school and the lifestyles of the rich and the infamous, and when the kid visits the Don's home, well, what painting do you think is hanging over the fireplace? Right. The Mona Lisa, <laughs> the one in the Louvre is a fake, <laughs> says the Don's daughter. The freshman is a wonderful original comedy. I enjoyed it very much, too. One of the things I liked about the Brando performance, of course, is that the way he kids Don Corleone is just to play Don Corleone. He doesn't, I mean, the dialogue and some of the actions are funny, but he doesn't trash the character. Oh, oh no. He does it with love and respect, and that's what makes it such a funny performance. Number eight on my list of the year's 10 best films is a movie that made me feel and made me think about the fragile existence of the human personality. Michael it's called Williams. Awakenings, and it stars Robin Williams as a shy, introverted neurologist who has a ward filled with patients who have been frozen in time and space for many years. Life has come to a halt for them. They can't speak, they can't move, until he gets an idea that a new experimental drug might bring them out of their endless trances. Robert De Niro co-stars in the film as Leonard, one of the patients, who with the help of the new drug is able to awaken and experience the joys and sorrows of real life after 30 years on the sidelines. I'm not a danger to myself or to others, and yet I'm still not allowed to go for a walk on my own by myself. You didn't wake a thing, you woke a person. I am a person. Awakenings is based on a famous book by Dr. Oliver Sacks, who was the inspiration for the Robin Williams character, and indeed, the whole movie is based on fact, on the bittersweet experiences of patients who were released from their private prisons only to face all sorts of other kinds of problems. The film is directed by Penny Marshall, who doesn't insult our intelligence when she deals with the medical details, but can find the emotion in the story, too. Well, I liked, um, and we just reviewed this picture, and I liked the uh, Robert De Niro performance, especially true. It does have a good heart to it. I found that uh, uh, Robin Williams' character was a little mannered for my taste, but it is a good film, not great. And we'll be back with more from our list of the best films of 1990. You're a very strange man. You have no idea. That's a droll moment from Reversal of Fortune and continuing this annual program where Gene and I both pick our personal choices for the best films of the year. Number five on my list is Barbe Schroeder's Reversal of Fortune, a sharp-edged and intelligent retelling of the trials of the aristocratic Klaus von Bülow, who was charged with trying to murder his wealthy socialite wife, Sonny, with an overdose of insulin. The movie stars Jeremy Irons in one of the year's very best performances as the mannered and ironic von Bülow, who plays verbal games with his lawyer, the Harvard law professor Alan Dershowitz. He's played by Ron Silver. Well, before you assume I'm guilty, won't you hear my story? No. Never let defendants explain. Puts most of them in an awkward position. How do you mean? Lying. Reversal of Fortune struck me strongly in more than one way. On the one hand, it's a fascinating recreation of this famous case based on the book by Dershowitz himself. On the other hand, it's a black comedy of manners in which the brash lawyer and the elegant defendant use all of their cleverness and curiosity of fence with one another. And neither one is really quite sure that he can really 
level with that other guy. Another layer of irony is added by having the character of Sonny Von Bulow, played by Glenn Close, narrate the movie herself. Well, this is number eight on my list. I think it's a very strong film, and it is a whole lot more complex than you would think. Rather than a straight procedural on, mm -hmm. on getting this guy off, uh, it is a real study of two very different classes, that the world of the, of the great palaces of Von Bulow and the funky, uh, hippie-esque uh, uh, house where all the law students gather yeah, with their uh, guru, uh, Alan Dershowitz. And I love those two worlds. It took a European director to come and look at those two worlds, and I think it's a great job. You know, I think that Schrader, it was a masterstroke yes. for uh, he and Nicholas Kazana wrote the screenplay to have it narrated by Sonny. Oh. Because if she were just there as a mute off screen presence, it would bring the whole movie to a screeching halt. And this way, it works on several levels. Barbara Schroeder is one of the people I thought could have done Bonfire of the Vanities a whole lot better than Brian De Palma did because of the work that he does in this picture. Mm -hmm. My number four selection is a film that was originally made in 1969, sat on a shelf for nearly two decades because the studio didn't think it was funny. And only after the director's children saw his private tape of the movie and encouraged him to enter it into film festivals was this very special comedy released. It's called The Plot Against Harry, and it's the story of a small-time New York racketeer, Harry Plotnick, who gets out of jail and decides through an odd set of circumstances to try to go straight for the sake of his estranged wife and children. And one of the better scenes involves Harry participating unintentionally in a TV telethon by suffering an anxiety attack. Love like ours that goes way beyond the stars. That's Martin Priest as the deadpan Harry Plotnick in a film written and directed by Michael Romer. The milieu here is New York Jewish, but Harry's story is a classic working man's tale, beat up and exhausted, trying to make a buck, keep his wife happy, and still eke out a pleasure or two. There isn't a predictable moment in The Plot Against Harry, a film full of big laughs. One more point, this film seems timeless because it was shot in black and white. I color, I think it would have looked dated, and I doubt whether it would have been re-released. What do you think of that? I love this film. I lingered for a long time uh, over it before deciding that technically it's one of the best films of 1969, not one of the be best films of 1990. But no one saw it. But I imagine that Martin Priest, who stars in this film, and Michael Romer, who directed it, must really be tickled that it's on your best ten list because here is a movie that the studio at the time, Columbia, right. was show, so short-sighted they couldn't even just look at the screen and see what a wonderful and funny and terrifically talented movie this was and it took 20 years until through a chain of accidents the movie was was resurrected yeah. at film festivals and now it's available what do you on, think on of, home video. What do you think of my theory that if it had been shot in color it would have looked so dated? If it had been shot in color among other things it would have faded because the color film of those days has not held up and it would have been all pink and ugly but black and white is timeless. Absolutely timeless. Yeah, that's right. To be we'll, have, we'll have more of the best movies of the year when we come back. How do I stack up as an advertisement for sobriety? You stack up, period. A scene from After Dark, My Sweet. My next selection for one of the best films of 1990 is number two on my list, a moody, emotional love story called After Dark, My Sweet, the story of a drifter named Collie, played by Jason Patrick, a terrific performance here at playing a punch-drunk boxer just out of a mental hospital. He's gun-shy and suspicious of affection and hardly ready to love someone, and yet, He's an open wound, a sweet puppy who's been kicked around. He meets someone similarly vulnerable, an alcoholic widow played by Rachel Ward, who is attracted to him, and he senses she has her problems, too. What's going to happen to you, Faye? <sighs> Nothing. The same has been happening since my husband died. I love it when he says that to her. What's going to happen to you, Faye? It's such a caring, Just natural scary. line of dialogue. It reminds me how rare it is to see such an elegant moment spoken in films. And this whole movie strikes that tone, all with a wild storyline that involves them in a kidnapping in a totally unpredictable conclusion that is as romantic as anything in Ghost or Pretty Woman. These are hard characters created by gritty novelist Jim Thompson, and I doubt whether I shall ever forget the love story of Collie and Faye. Well, it's a very, very interesting movie. Oddly enough, on my top ten list is another movie based on a novel by Jim Thompson, and that's right. The Grifters. Yes. And I doubt if I will ever forget the love story in that movie either. And uh, that's the one I happen to pick instead of After Dark, My Sweet. But this whole area of film noir, of gritty people uh, in shifty situations with lots of shadows and dramatic developments and secrets from out of the past is something that I'm a sucker for 
anywhere I can I, find you. And I want to tell you why I think you're a sucker and I am too, and why and it has to do with why and there are a lot of crime films or people who are criminals in, in, in my list this year. I think that we're so fed up with seeing the uh, completed character who's just marched along through a story mm -hmm. that when you get someone whose flaws are very direct and honest and they're, they're right out there, uh, it's something that is, is lively. Now that's a about. really interesting point because so many movies start out with the character exactly the way the character is going to be at the end. Correct. And the very definition of a crime movie is something's going to happen along the way and we don't know it and they don't know it. So, so that's a good point. In second you. place on my list of the year's best films is an elegant and macabre and wonderfully acted French crime movie named Monsieur Hire. It's based on a novel by George Simenon, the master of psychological crime stories, and it stars Michelle Blanc and Sandrine Bonaer in a bizarre relationship. They never really meet until it's too late, but every day this bald little man watches her from his darkened window, and she knows that he's there. And what exactly is their relationship? At first, it seems to be based on voyeurism and exhibitionism, but then a murder victim is found in the neighborhood, and of course, the weird and reclusive Monsieur Hire is the prime suspect. Did he commit the crime? Does the woman know who really did? The director of this film, Patrice LeConte, is a master at drawing out all of the subtle and twisted implications of this story, all leading up to one of the most original and sensational and truthful and overwhelming final shots I've ever seen in the movies. Monsieur Hire didn't play in a lot of cities around the country, but now it's coming out on video and you can see for yourself. And I recommend it very strongly, too. In my list, this would have been number 12. Number 12, out? okay. Yeah, in these great distinctions. Uh, it is a terrific film. Voyeurism uh, is at the essence of the movie-going experience, mm -hmm. and films that tackle that subject and do it well uh, are, are totally beguiling, and I was caught up in it just the way you expressed it. Coming up next, our individual choices for the best film of 1990. Best film of the year. And for me, really, in 1990, there was only one possible choice. Martin Scorsese's brilliant and funny and violent and truthful film, Goodfellas. Scorsese is, in my opinion, the best director in the world right now, and this is just playing one of the best movies I've ever seen. A story told from the inside about a mafia professional who thinks that stealing is more fun than anything else in life. We walked out with $420,000 without using a gun, and we did the right thing. We gave Paulie his tribute. It's going to be a good summer. That's Ray Liotta as the mafioso there, and the other good fellows include Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Paul Sorvino. Scorsese plunges into the mafia with incredible energy. This film breathes with life, and it's heart-stopping the way he takes you through the highs and lows of this man's life until the last out-of-control day when his whole world comes crashing down. Goodfellas is without any question the best film of this year. Well, you're not going to get any question from me. For the third time in 11 years, Martin Scorsese has directed the best film of the year, according to me, and I just learned, Roger, too. Raging Bull topped my list in 1980. The Last Temptation of Christ topped it in 1988. And now Goodfellas, a movie that displays the moral courage to rewrite the gangster movie image, declaring that these mobsters and their hangers-on are nothing but animals. Goodfellas, in a wide range of music and photographic style, spans three decades of crimes from hijacking to drug deals, following the exploits of a mobster in training, Ray Liotta, as he gets his first taste of mob madness. Seven G's you owe me Seven thousand dollars, I mean, hey, peanuts. I don't mean to be out of order, none. You don't mean to be out of order? She says, good, you don't mean to be out of order, Sonny. You call embarrassing me in front of my friends, don't know, like, call me a deadbeat. You know, you know, Sonny, you're a real you know the money we spend is... Come on, don't be like that. What do you mean, don't be like that? That's Joe Pesci in the scariest role I've seen in a long time. One of the lines of narration that Ray Liotta speaks that I think also really sums up the film is that when he says that mobsters or wise guys think that people who work for a living are suckers. And boy, that's it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They think we're fools. And for every working man that has laughed at uh, the exploits of the mobs, mob in the movies, and certainly there have been a lot of pictures like that, that one really has to hurt a little bit. It's insights like those that strip away the romantic veneer of movies like, frankly, the Godfather films 
the veneer that has been placed on mob types. All that in Goodfellas, plus some of the most innovative editing I've seen in a picture in a long time, make this easily the best film of the year. And we saw a scene there that is typical of the kind of scene that Scorsese is famous for, the mm -hmm. eruption of violence out right. of nowhere. Things are quiet, somebody loses his temper, and then suddenly there's a fight. Uh, typically, guys in expensive suits and coats and nice polished shoes are clumsily uh, trying to kill each other, is a, one of his trademarks. But in this movie, there's another murder scene, another killing scene, that is the most chilling scene that Martin Scorsese has ever put on film. And you know the one I'm thinking the of. The kid gets With Joe Pesci. Yeah. No, Joe Pesci. And he, all he says is, oh no. He realizes. He suddenly realizes something. And one of the things he realizes is that his entire life has been a house of cards. And that, oh no, that moment, to me, is at the heart of this movie. It is a great movie. Well, I want to go to the last shot of the film, which is uh, it's a, almost like a flash frame in there. And you see a, a pose of a gangster in a very romantic fashion. And then we cut to uh, this very real gangster who his life is, means absolutely nothing and is hardly romantic. It's uh, insulting to a human life. And I think what Scorsese is doing is showing us that there's a whole movie history uh, of 90 years of cinema that has romanticized the violent figure and he's saying but hey, it just this is what so. they really you know, are. Another thing about this film is the detail which he sees everyday life. The close-ups, mm. the ways that he breaks down actions into showing how people do them and why they do them. The clothes, the decor, the, the dialogue, the clubs they hang out in, the food they eat, the recipes mm. they use. It's all there. A lot of those details are in the book right from the very beginning with the pinky rings and the way that they wait down a car and when they get out of it. That's <laughs> really in the very first pages of the book, and Nick Pelleggi, who co-wrote the screenplay, gets the credit, too. Okay, so, Goodfellas, the best movie of the year, so say both of us. And when we come back, Gene and I will both review our full list in order of the top ten films of the year. ...the special show on the best films we saw this past year. From bottom to top, my list of the ten best films of 1990. Number ten, The Godfather, Part Three. It's not in the same league as the first two, but it is quite powerful and rich nonetheless. Number nine, Andrew Bergman's offbeat comedy, The Freshman. Number eight, the Klaus von Bülow, Alan Dershowitz story, Reversal of Fortune. Number seven, Kevin Costner's stirring revival of the Western genre, Dances with Wolves. Number six, the year's best action movie with Bruce Willis as the reluctant hero in Rennie Harlan's Die Hard 2. Number five, Bertrand Blier's odd romance with Gerard Depardieu falling for a plain woman over his beautiful wife in Too Beautiful for You. Number four, The Plot Against Harry. Number three, Barry Levinson's immigrant drama, A Family Disintegration, Avalon. And number two, James Foley's dark love story with Jason Patrick in a star-making performance after Dark My Sweet. And the number one best film of 1990, Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. And yours? So those are your 10 and my 10 choices in order. We're number 10, Bob Rapelson's Mountains of the Moon, the epic story of the great Victorian explorer Richard Burton and his compulsive search for the sources of the Nile. Number 9, Peter Greenaway's The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover, the scathing and shocking allegory of a corrupt modern society all told within the walls of a restaurant that's a version of hell. Number eight, Penny Marshall's Awakenings, the story of a modern-day Rip Van Winkle. Number seven, Uli Adele's shocking and hard-hitting last exit to Brooklyn with its lost souls in a bleak urban landscape. Number six, a sleeper worth looking for, Alejandro Jodorowsky's Santa Sangre, a visionary fable set in the circus world about a woman with no arms and her son who fears he has no soul. Number five, Barbara Schroeder's Reversal of Fortune with Jeremy Irons as Klaus von Bülow. Number four, Stephen Frears' The Grifters, the cynical and ironic crime story with great performances by John Cusack, Angelica Houston, and Annette Bening. Number three, Dances with Wolves, the story of a man who gets to know American Indians for himself. Number two, Patrice Leconte's Monsieur Hire. And number one, my choice as the best film of the year, Goodfellas. And let me say something right now, because you and I have picked Goodfellas, Every critics group has picked Goodfellas. I think maybe it might be time for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences mm -hmm. to make some recognition of the fact that Martin Scorsese is alive and working in the film industry today. He made the best movie of the 80s, Raging Bull, according to every poll that was taken anywhere, the best movie of the 70s, Taxi Driver. Now he's made Goodfellas, and they'll probably wind up giving the, the prize again to some respectable little do-gooding picture or something. Well, it may be Kevin Costner's Dances with Wolves, which is the third well, on your list. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. But still, no, I, I, would, I mean, talking... that's a good picture, but Scorsese is up there in a different category. Uh, he is in a different category. Three films that we agreed on, Dances with Wolves, uh, Goodfellas, 
and uh, Barbara Schroeder's uh, reversal of fortune. So we have seven differences in our list. It was not a great, having said that, all uh, complimented to the Scorsese picture, it was not a great year for films. Would you agree? I only gave four stars to eight movies. That's real low year. for you. Yeah. Okay. So much for the best. Next week, the worst films of 1990. One last shot at some terrible films. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. It's America's favorite jelly bean, Jelly Belly, now appearing at theaters and video stores with good taste. Jelly Belly beans, try them, you'll love them. New Dynatrim, the delicious, nutritious weight loss plan from the makers of Centrum. Shake it, freeze it, or mousse it, and lose yourself in the taste. rice a the San Francisco treat. Now with 30 flavors, you can serve it every day for a month and never serve the same dish twice. Got a new VCR? Then you need the 1991 edition of Roger Ebert's Movie Home Companion. Now over a thousand full-length movie reviews.